Welcome, fair traveler, curious child of his. I am Brendan of Ireland, and through his light and voice have these stones spoken to me. Brennan of Clonfort, circa 515. Hello, I'm Andrew, and I want to welcome you to Visions of the Past, a podcast all about the lore of Assassin's Creed. This is episode 81, and today we're going to talk about Brendan of Clonfort. You might be thinking to yourself, who? This isn't a name I recognize. And that makes perfect sense, because Brendan of Clonfort isn't front and center in any Assassin's Creed title. He isn't even a secondary character. The only place where you will find information on Brendan of Clonfort is in the Standing Stone puzzles of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. This might even raise the question within yourself of why we are talking about him. Well, there are a few reasons. One, he was actually a historical person. And two, his journal entries that we find with the Standing Stone puzzles could potentially lead into something interesting if the story is told right. But before we get into all of that, let's first talk about who Brendan of Clonfort really was. Born around 484 in Tralee, Ireland, to parents named Finlug and Cara, within an Irish clan called Altridge, Brendan of Clonfort was baptized by Eric of Slane in Tubid. Brendan spent his early life being educated by St. Eat of Kiletti and St. Finian of Clonard, leading him to being considered one of the Twelve Apostles of Ireland. At the age of 26, Brennan was ordained by a priest named Eric, possibly even Eric of Slane, after which he founded a handful of monasteries. Brennan of Clonfort is often known by other adjectives, such as the Navigator, the Voyager, the Anchorite, and the Bold. Because, shortly after he was ordained, he started to travel. He traveled between Scotland and France, and sometime around 530, he went on a seven-year voyage to find paradise. This voyage took him to what some called the Isle of the Blessed, while others called it St. Brendan's Island. This journey is written within the voyages of St. Brendan the Abbot, which was recorded around the year 900. After his seven-year journey, Brennan would continue going around places in Ireland and Britain, building monasteries, eventually passing around 577 in Anagadown, Ireland, while visiting his sister Briga. Worried that others would use his remains as relics, Brennan arranged for his body to be returned to the monastery in Clonfort, concealed in a luggage cart. Eventually, he was interned at Clonfort Cathedral, with the Catholic Church eventually recognizing him as a saint, with his feast day being May 16th. Within Assassin's Creed Valhalla, though, we never see Brendan. We only find 13 journal entries from Brendan at the beginning of each Standing Stone puzzle. These are narrated by Brendan, as voiced by Simon Lee Phillips. And let's take a look at these entries and see what deeper meanings they may have. The first entry we find at Roland Rich. Welcome, fair traveler, curious child of his. I am Brendan of Ireland, and through his light and voice, these stones have spoken to me. Here lies the markings of him, where a second voice, higher than most, spoke to me again. Listen to all I have learned through prayer. Long ago was a great and tragic war, the offsprings of gods who lived before the deluge. I pray for these rebel agents who came before. This one in particular mentions the Great and Tragic War, along with the Deluge. These are clear references to the human Isu War and the Great Catastrophe, indicating that Brendan knows something of the Isu and their downfall, even if it's not fully clear to him. The Standing Stone Puzzle at My Self Fold is our next journal entry. And it states, Here, I believe, is where the Nephilim placed sacred stones to guard the chattel of God from other giants. Those present were scared by demons, and God defended the pious, sending the giants away. Only these holy reverberations remain. The work of good souls, who have the earth in their heart, 
will forever be tied to our ancestors and our Lord via this gateway. The big thing in this entry is the use of the words Nephilim and chattel. The Nephilim were mysterious beings mentioned in the Hebrew Bible that were big and strong. The word itself loosely translates to giants, and some traditional Jewish explanations interpreted them as fallen angels. Chattel is used in law as an item of property that is not real estate. The Nephilim are clearly supposed to be the Isu themselves, but what is the property that they are meant to be protecting? Our third entry we found a road stand monolith, and it goes as such. Again, I find traces of the Nephilim. By edict of the local king, I shall prayeth to him, that his light may be known as holy. These luminous placards are the divining rods of him who speaks to me. With effort, I seek the union of all his holy creations. Eta, Juno, Minerva, names that enter my head. Are these the Nephilim? He reveals to me, Are these stones their signposts? I pray for your guidance, Lord. Amen. The one thing that really jumps out here is the name drops of Aita, Juno, and Minerva. These are three of the most well-known Isu throughout the series, and it starts to paint a picture that the information that Brendan has comes from within himself, and not from something external like a piece of Eden. Our next entry is found in the Asphorida Stones. The kingdoms of Bernica and Elmet have granted me the right to worship here, by edict of Eopa of Bernica. The Nephilim were the only race with the strength to have moved such pillars with the power of the Lord behind them. But what were they guarding against? Did you command them, Lord? Was it for the sin of people of other times? Was it to keep the demons out? This century really doesn't give us more information. But it does ask a few questions. What did they use these standing stones for? Our next entry was found at a place called Lord and Lady. I shall inform the local Wafengas that he lives among them. Through traces of the Nephilim, the giant warriors who fought for God in their ancient times. They hath left his presence here on earth for us to absorb his light. The light of angels that hath been infused throughout the earth. I feel his power. He calls me my beloved, and I am calmed. I respondeth to my communion, my piety, and become another of his voices. The one new piece of information that comes out of this entry is that Brendan is called my beloved by God. This starts to draw connections to Aida and his sages, and their thoughts on Juno, as most of them called Juno, beloved. The following entry was found at Constantin. Here lieth still more remnants of the Nephilim. I have marked a symbol upon the stones that future folk may imbue their spirit with the energy within. For those who wish to seek communion with the Lord here, be wary. For he speaks through ciphers and his words are woven with ancient fibers. He is manifest here. He hath made importance of these pillars brought by the giants of yore. Now, guarding us only as he knows. Amen. For the most part, this entry doesn't have a lot of new information to it, except for the idea that God speaks through ciphers, and that the true meaning of them and how he speaks them is truly known only to him. The next entry was found at Hyothberg Hjall. I am proud the Lord speaks so clearly through my soul here in Reconset. He talks of his instruments, and asks that I be one. It appears the Nephilim were at battle here long ago, against a great tempest. Some few protected us. We must honor these ancient paths. I explained what he left for us here to the Reckon dwellers nearby. Blessed be all those who tread in his holy light. The way that this entry is laid out, it acts like the thoughts in Brendan's head are louder in this area, and that he is starting to be swayed to the path of the Isu, and that at the location of Yothberg Law, it saw a battle that most likely was during the human Isu war, but that of course is just speculation. Our next message came at Devil's Quotas. 
I spoke with him again. He said that he pinned, and I feel torn in two. My loyalty to him tears me one direction, and the Nephilim point elsewhere. Why hath these voices spoken to me? The gospel sing within me, and yet I sense conflict. I sense disagreement among the angels. It saddens me greatly. I will one day weigh my soul, attempt to repent for the missteps in my life, Yet here all shineth brightest, for he let me see. This entry makes it seem like Brendan is confused and unsure if he should follow the voice in his head or what he sees around the standing stones, and it makes him question why he was the one being spoken to, and the conflict that he senses around these stones has saddened him. Our next entry came at Seahenge. I have come upon these ancient timbers, Tarred for preservation to mark my sacred symbol and pinpoint the source of their power. As I pray, the Lord sends through me the voice of a Holy Spirit. It reverberates with the finery of ancient language, and I am made anew. Were these timbers carried by the Nephilim? Barriers against invasions from afar? Please, Lord, let this truth shineth upon me as bright as your word doth. The highlight of this entry is that he can understand the Isu language and that hearing it, it revitalizes his spirit. The next message from Brendan came at the Menunge Megaliths. Here, in the ancient kingdom of Kent, the Jutes have brought me to where his fire burns through traces of the Nephilim. Here the Lord speaks to me again. He warns of betrayals, of struggles, of the trials of the first ones. I do not always understand his message. If he is warning me, it is because he believes I am worthy. He says there is one angel still trapped, she who must be released, or joined. Must I find her? The big message here is Brendan is hearing from inside him that there is one still trapped and that she must be released asking himself, is this a mission that I must do? His next message came at Avbury Megaliths. Here in Chu Valley, old kings of Wiccas still dance with the stones of the Nephilim. I have taught them of the power that sings here. How dare you trample with these sacred threads, a voice scolded me. You must leave me, he said, divorced from the Illuminati. His voice waxes and wanes, but a soft song still finds me in my penance. I bend a knee and leave a grain of sand for the old winds. Now this message makes it seem like the voice and memories within Brendan are still growing and evolving with him, being upset of what he's doing. And then the statement about being divorced from the Illuminati makes it feel like he's upset with how Brendan is acting. Our next message came at Stonehenge. This is a different sight, one resplendent in a matter unto itself, where his light shines greatest. Today I was warned of a harrowing depth. After the Nephilim, great battles were fought in resurrective kingdoms of Christ. Many were lost in the fight, many more in the cataclysm that followed. Today my Lord instructed me in plain words to travel o'er the ocean and seek the door behind which hides his fallen angel. I shall try in his name. Amen. This entry is one that really speaks out. You can clearly see the symbolism to the human Isu war, and that Brendan was requested to find this Isu that's still locked away. Final message from Brendan was found at Teana Takatan. Here I, Brendan of Clonfort, servant of our Lord, do make my final inscription before this holy mount of light. My journey is ended. For two and some years, I have heeded the inner voice of my Lord and followed it to this place to receive his word. I have seen the gate with its ancient markings. I have heard the voice of his angel calling me beloved. Yet the way did not open. Yet his voice yet calls to me still. In blissful forms, torturous to me. Yet the way remains closed. 
my way forward is uncertain. Now this entry was found in Vinland, not too far from the entrance to the Grand Temple. And this message that ties together Brandon's life story with an Assassin's Creed. Here he states he has found the Grand Temple, and he could hear the voice of the one locked inside, and that she called out to him, and his failure to open the door led to the voice inside him to continue to call him, torturing him. And now he's here, so close for that voice, and his way is unclear to him. When you tie all these messages together, I think that Brendan's historic journeys across the world is pretty straightforward. Historically, the voyage that took him to the Isle of the Blessed in St. Brendan's Island is often believed to possibly have been a journey to North America. So a story was created for him that saw the reason for this as a voice he heard within himself that he took as the voice of God. After breaking down his message, I'm sure you have already come to know what I'm going to say, but I believe that Brendan was a sage of Aida's line. It seems to me that memories of Aida were interpreted by Brendan as the voice of God and as visions of the Nephilim, and that he took his journeys as a way to free Juno from her confinement within the Grand Temple. There is one thing, though, that kind of sits in the back of my head that makes me doubt, at least a little bit, if Brennan was designed to open the Grand Temple and release Juno, why didn't he know about the key? And is the DNA of Aida showing specific memories? Like, after all of these years of knowing about Aida's sages, going all the way back to John Standish and Bartholomew Roberts in Assassin's Creed IV Black Flag, we know so little about how they work. Like, we know that they have heterochromia and... I'm forgetting the other eye mutation that they have. But we don't know if they are a certain segment of an Isu genome, if it's just because you hit so much of a percentage. We don't know exactly how it breaks down from a DNA standpoint. We know that at one point something kicks in and Aida's memories start to take over, much like what we saw with Loki and Bassam. But what causes it? Is it possible to have certain segments of his DNA and still be considered a sage? Like if you don't have the the eye mutations, can you still be a sage? Because if you look at Jacques de Molay, we see that he doesn't have heterochromia, though that can be explained away as it being a helix memory that has been edited. But there are so many, so many questions for me that I have when it comes to Aida. And I, and I wonder if it's kind of like Aletheia in the staff. Can the DNA memories or like a DNA consciousness talk to the person himself, like, because we have this other sage by the name of Elijah, who I mentioned a handful of weeks ago, and he was able to use another extra percent of Isu DNA that he got from his father to essentially push back the memories. Were these memories, like, all the same that came forward, or are they all separate? There's just so many questions that I still have about the way sages work in general, not just Aida's sage. But what is it that you think of Brendan and the story told within these standing stones? Let me know over on Twitter at visions underscore AC. Thank you for joining me today. Be sure to tune in every Tuesday for new episodes. If you love stories about Assassin's Creed lore, please follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcasting platform. And tell your friends about this podcast. If you have any questions about Assassin's Creed or topics you'd like me to cover, please feel free to hit me up on Twitter and Instagram at visions underscore AC. You can find those links in the show notes below. Until next time, my Assassin friends, make sure to follow the Creed. And to those Templars listening, may the Father of Understanding guide you.